what the next 30 minutes are going to look like. Uh, we're going to start off with two quick cases, mostly just to wake us up in this early, early hour. Uh, and then we're going to go over what the current guidelines are, focusing on the Canadian anesthesiology guidelines. And then we'll dive into some to, to, to what the evidence uh, is, has looked like over the last um, several decades with regards to gastric contents and how that relates to aspiration risks and what all this has to do with, with your fasting status. And then fin finally, we'll compare and contrast um, all the studies from done from an anesthesia point of view versus what, in my opinion, is more relevant to us today, um, the studies that are out in the ED setting. So without further ado, um, obviously I have no conflicts of interest. Um, this is case number one, and yes, that's my, that's my little guy. Uh, so let's say that you're working in the ED of a community hospital, uh, and this two-year-old little kiddo comes in following a fall. Unfortunately, he's, you find that he has a distal radial fracture on his x-ray. It's gonna need a closed reduction, um, but you're looking at the kid, he's still covered in all that red lovely pasta that he ate less than two hours ago. Um, is this a case where you should delay sedation um, and what other factors would you consider before making that choice? Uh, case number two, uh, and this is slightly embellished, but also a real case that I've seen. Um, let's say you're at the same community hospital and a 34 year old obese man, he's got a history of OSA, he's got a hiatal hernia. Uh, he comes in via EMS um, and he was literally coming out the McDonald's door, minding his own business and got assaulted by three unknown assailants. Um, he has multiple contusions to his ribs. He's got an obviously deformed ankle, which of course for our purposes is gonna need a reduction with sedation. Um, but otherwise, let's say he's hemodynamically stable. And in this case, same question, uh, would you wait to sedate this person or would you sedate them right away for that reduction? And what other factors would you consider? Um, so this kind of leads me to the, to, to, to the, the reason for my talk. I, um, I, I have a nasty habit of asking myself the, the why like, a, like an inquisitive four-year-old. So when I was looking at the, the fasting guidelines for, for these two particular cases, um, I had to, I started diving deeper and deeper into the literature until I had to figure out what, where, all, where all this stuff comes from. So my question uh, that hopefully we'll be able to answer today is uh, in patients who don't meet those fasting guidelines that we're gonna talk about in a second, um, should procedural sedation be delayed uh, for these Oh, we'll put it in quotes here, urgent ED procedure. So obviously our patient population is gonna be patients that are in the ED that are undergoing uh, procedural sedation as their intervention, control is whether or not they've been fasting and the outcomes that we're looking at or aspiration risk and risk of other complications as well. So this might not come as a surprise to any of you, but there have been a few advancements in um, the way that we sedate people um, from, even just 10 to 15 years ago versus now. Uh, I mean, if you look at the complication rates, um, specifically aspiration back in the 1960s, 1980s, when they used horse doses of uh, barbiturates and propofol and stuff like that, the, the complication rates, depending on where you look, ranged anywhere between one and 400 to one and 800, give or take. Um, nowadays, um, depending on what source you look at, a like an aspiration risk on average uh, is very, very rare. And we're going to go over a lot of the data today. Um, but comparatively, it's 0.7 to 10 in 10,000 cases. So like orders of magnitude difference. Um, so and just so we're all on the same page, um, I just posted here the American Society of Anesthesiology's continuum depth of sedation. As everyone knows, sedation isn't just an on off thing. Uh, there is a continuum where us in the ED, we tend to operate in the moderate, sometimes deep sedation areas, whereas our anesthesia colleagues, depending on what they're doing, are, are in the quote unquote general anesthesia um, level of that spectrum. And, and the difference is important to make in, in our in our um, in our talk here today, because there are multiple differences between procedural sedation and general anesthesia. The main one being, in our, for our purposes in the ED, when we put someone to sleep for a reduction or an um, abscess drainage, what have you, um, typically we're maintaining that airway patent, right? We're not sedating to the point where they're completely flaccid and require mechanical or assisted ventilation. Um, we also don't tend to use the fancy imidogenic inhalational stuff that the anesthesiologists use, like sevoflurane fluoride and things like that. Yes, we do use some, uh, a lot of the time we use ketamine, which is also imidogenic, but not nearly to the point um, of these other inhalational agents. 
And uh, thirdly, as much as we'd like to think that we're the rock stars of the universe and all the patients that we see are the sickest patients that there are, statistically, that is just not true. Um, the ASA or the, like, the comorbid severity status of the patients that we do see for procedural sedations, on average, are much lower. We tend to sedate the healthy young people, the ASA ones and twos, much more often than the threes and fours. And finally, when, when we sedate someone, it's typically for stuff like, again, reductions, asper, um, abscess drainages, things of that sort. Um, and it's very, very rare that we manipulate the airway in any meaningful way during one of these procedures, uh, unless you have like a very large like, complex laceration in the oropharynx. But again, at that point, sometimes you just involve surgery and get anesthesia involved anyway. So not typically something that's always done in the ED. Um, and because uh, I am a history nerd, sometimes mostly the ancient Roman stuff, but um, I always like to see like historically what, what have guidelines been. And I managed to find that in the old age of 1883, there was actually a British surgeon who came up with uh, his fasting guidelines of his own for surgeries, mostly just, you know, hacking off limbs and things like that. Um, but he, he would stipulate that you'd have to have two hours uh, free of clear fluids and four to six hours for solids, which is pretty impressive considering that that's, as you're going to see, very similar to what the guidelines are now, and it's 140 years ago. Um, obviously, the stuff that they were using back then in terms of sedation is very different. Typically, if you're curious, they would either just stone you cold with industrial amounts of alcohol and go from there. Um, but those kind of quote unquote guidelines uh, stayed in place for, for quite some time up until the, the 60s, um, where the, especially in, in, in the US, where they, they came up with the strict NPO after midnight, you don't eat anything for at least five hours before any kind of sedation or surgery, which more or less persisted up until the mid to 80s, where then they had this more graded guidelines based on whether or not you ate solids versus clear fluids, etc. And those guidelines have kind of perpetuated on till till today, especially from the anesthesia uh, society perspective. Um, so right here that you have on the screen now is what the, the Canadian Anesthesiology Society guidelines are in 2019. Uh, this is for moderate sedation. So basically, like as I was saying, it's, it's a graded system where you have uh, eight hours, they recommend uh, fasting for anything solid or fatty, six hours for a light meal, four hours for breast milk, uh, and two hours for clear fluids. And for those of you that are curious why like breast milk and non-human milk are on different categories is because uh, breast milk dissolve, um, digests much, much quicker, almost to the, to the rate of a clear fluid um, in those babies. Um, and, and again, uh, another thing that I found interesting is if you look at the incidence rates over time, as our guidelines for fasting have gotten more, quote unquote, loose or lax, the incidence rate of aspiration and other complications has also gone down, not up. So that's all well and good. I mean, you go on the anesthesiology website, you see these uh, fasting guidelines, and you're like, great, cool. How did you guys come up with that? And unfortunately, that that's an answer that was a little harder to find than I thought it would be. So I had to kind of go digging for treasure, as it were, to figure out the, the origins of, of, this, uh, of these guidelines. And, and the reason why it's, it's not so easy is because essentially, uh, as with a lot of other guidelines around there, uh, they're largely based on consensus. So you just get a bunch of anesthesiologists in a room, they decide on what, how many hours sounds about right, and they go with that. Um, and the reason they have to do that is because there's not a really good large scale prospective like RCT on whether or not my stomach is full causes more risk of aspiration. As delicious as a, here's this cheeseburger, let me then sedate you study would be, Ethically, it's difficult to do these kinds of uh, studies, which then leads to limitations in the data that we can collect, right? So if we're doing all kinds of retrospective studies looking at, and what we're gonna see many of them, that's, that's really all that we can have um, in terms of like high quality data, uh, you, you lack a, a significant control in that event. You're just looking at aspirations, uh, aspirations as a whole that have already happened and you can't control for anything. Um, but if you are astigious enough, you can look back to the lovely year of 1974, again, history, um, where this is a, where in large part, the scientific basis for these <clears throat> fasting guidelines have come from. 
Um, so this group, Roberts et al. in 1974, did a very complex study using a rhesus monkey, uh, just the one, where essentially they, they intubate the monkey and then uh, aspirate its gastric contents, split it up into two vials, uh, make one pH like three or four and leave the other one as a low pH of around one, 1.5. Um, and then they would take the high pH gastric fluid, which was equivalent to 25 mils in terms of human volumes and stick it down the lung. And then uh, the, the monkey would have, as you would expect, ARDS-like features, DSAT, et cetera. And then they would support the monkey until it got better. And then once the monkey got better, they extubated the monkey, reintubated the other lung, and then took the more acidic content uh, gastric uh, juices and stuck it down the tube. And then the monkey coded. And then from that, they surmised that, well, all you need is 25 mils of, a, of, of an acidic solution uh, from gastric contents to cause significant enough aspiration for, for you to code. Um, and, that, and then from then on, that's where it just kind of snowballed. And there hasn't been much in terms of a human really uh, correlative study done because as, as I said before, ethically doing this kind of thing isn't very uh, easy to get past an ethics board. Um, but just to poke more holes in this, this kind of foundational studies, if you look at other animal studies, like in, in 86, this is the Plourd group, they took a bunch of cats and did laparotomies on them. And before doing the laparotomies, they dye their stomach contents blue. And then they look afterwards in the oral pharynx and nasopharynx, and they look at, in the hypopharynx with the bronch and be like, oh, um, if you have blue anywhere around there, then they must have aspirated. And that's just about as far as um, the study really went in terms of uh, of depth. And when you convert a cat stomach volume to a human stomach volume, um, that's, they would say that you needed about 1.5 liters of fluid, which is a large, large difference than the 25 mils studied before uh, in order to, to pro have a risk of aspiration. So this huge variability and, and obviously lots of limitations with these animal studies, which is what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here. And also interestingly, one of the reasons why this kind of perpetuated later on is um, Six years later, after the initial study, Roberts, uh, they, they, had, they published this uh, op-ed saying they had this one case that they were actually being sued for, so they couldn't talk about it in detail, where they had an unintubated female patient that had an aspiration of unknown volume and unknown pH, but behaved very similarly to the monkey where she coded after the aspiration. So they're like, oh, uh, we must have maintained strict guidelines in terms of NPO status because these things can happen. But not much in terms of large scale data in that regard. Um, and this was going to be the part where I went into detail about gastric contents and all the different studies, but we just don't have the time. There are many, many small scale studies out there looking at well, if your pH is X or Y, um, or if you fast for this amount of time or that amount of time, or if you give an H1 blocker or an H2 blocker, um, what happens to your pH, what happens to your gastric volume, which are all very interesting to go through. But at the end of the day, none of them have really shown a clear relationship between uh, gastric acidity or volume and the probability of an aspiration. In fact, um, some, a lot of the studies, even the smaller scale ones would show that if you're only fasting for clear fluids for a shorter amount of time, meaning around two hours, uh, your stomach contents are less acidic and less uh, voluminous than if you were fasting for longer. Um, and finally, just to poke even more holes in all this, there is a physiological concept of a silent aspiration where as much as we'd like to think that our glottises are perfect, they are not when we're sleeping, there is a certain amount of gastric fluid and saliva and et cetera that is seeping down into your uh, respiratory tract, which obviously does not cause any kind of respiratory compromise. And this same phenomenon is almost certainly occurring during any kind of sedation and anesthesia, even intubated with a cuff, there's a certain amount of these, these fluids that are going down, but they're not significant enough that it causes a physiological response that is important to us clinically. So the bottom line really is that there isn't a really good clear relationship between how much stuff is in your stomach and the risk for your aspiration, um, which is, is very difficult in terms of me answering this question. Uh, so really what we're left with is retrospectively looking at um, what the aspiration risks have been uh, and whether or not we can tie any risk factors to those. And to, for that, we're gonna start to compare and contrast the anesthesiology world versus uh, our world. 
Um, the reason being that, uh, as you might imagine, anesthesiologists put people to sleep much more often than we do, so they have done it. Uh, they have a larger case sample than, than we could ever hope to have. So to start things off, uh, we're going to go a little bit uh, back in time, just to, again, sh sh illustrate to you the, the trends in time in terms of how these things have been going down. Um, so this study by Warner et al. back in 1993 looked at almost a quarter million general anesthesia cases, wherein they found a total of 67 aspiration cases, which amounts to about one in every 3,000 cases, um, with 15 of those occurring during emergency surgery. Now, most of them did very well. Uh, 42 of the 67 um, had absolutely no evidence of respiratory or radiologic cyclae after even just two hours. Right? So they would define aspiration as they saw the person vomit, uh, they'd have some form of DSAT or respiratory status change, um, then they do x-ray and what follow-ups afterwards. And after two hours, they were completely fine. However, 13 of those patients did require prolonged mechanical ventilation and three of the patients did pass away. Uh, next up, a pediatric study of a few years later, 1998. This one's looking at 50,000 GA cases. They had about 52 aspirations or 0.1%, one in 1,000. They ex experienced no deaths or significant complications in any of their aspirations. Uh, and they found that sig uh, more significantly, almost all of the aspirations, you had four times as a higher chance of being in the aspiration group if your ASA class was higher, three or four. Uh, next up, something a little more, um, a little more recent. And this one looks at um, more pr uh, deep procedural sedations. Uh, it's a review article uh, published in Anesthesia in 2017 by the Green Group, which publishes a lot of these studies that we're going to go through. Um, it looked at around 1,200 articles uh, total, and then narrowed it down to around 35 of which that described any kind of aspiration events. And what they found is the vast majority of these, and this is uh, including settings like um, endoscopy, which we're going to talk about, colonoscopies, intensivist sedations, ED sedations a little bit, um, <clears throat> and other procedural sedations done in an anesthesia uh, OR setting. Um, the vast majority of the procedural sedations that they found uh, that had complications were during endoscopy, like 292 uh, of them were, were, were in that category, and only 34 occurred outside of the endoscopy suite. Of those 34 that weren't doing endoscopies, which we don't do in the eMERGE every day, obviously, um, 31 of them fully recovered. Uh, uh, there was an unknown recovery in about two of them, and there was one uh, death, which I believe in this case was a colonoscopy for a multi-morbid uh, solid and a solid tumor with met metastases was cachectic and having a lower GI bleed, which is why they were getting the C-scope. Um, so not the healthiest person to begin with. Um, there we are. And, and next up, this is this is one of the better studies that have come out. Uh, again, pediatric population, but the sample size is quite enormous. Um, and they did a lot of good research with regards to NPO status and not. Um, so this study comes out uh, in 2016 in anesthesia published by Beach et al. Um, again, pediatric population, looking at around 139,000 procedural sedations, uh, most of which for, for MRI slash CT sedation, um, a large chunk of the rest being uh, ICU or endoscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, things like that. And they found uh, absolutely uh, zero deaths uh, in any of their um, studies as well. And they had only 10 total aspirations. Um, if you uh, if you look up the total like amount of major complications they had, which could range from just needing a prolonged admission versus quote unquote cardiac arrest, um, most of which were the prolonged admission uh, side of it, there were about 46 of those. And a quarter of these patients were, were uh, not meeting the fasting guidelines. They were using the same ones that I talked to you about earlier. So 23.5% of them were not NPO. And when they looked at just first straight up NPO versus not NPO, there was no significant difference in aspiration risk or complication risk of any other kind when you con uh, controlled first things like age, ASA status, and whatnot. Uh, and they essentially found you know, the NPO group had 5.6 per 10,000 and non-NPO group 5.9 per 10,000, which was not statistically significant. Um, I'm gonna mention this paper a few more times. So just a few more points about this one is that um, 
the, the, the way the study was designed, it was multi-center and they'd have, uh, they'd always use what's called like sedation teams. So these were highly trained people, uh, groups of people that would just essentially go around the hospital and doing all these sedations. So it's not, uh, so, so, so the level of expertise is higher and therefore you would expect the complication rates as a whole to be lower because of that. So it may or may not be applicable to more community settings and things like that, just to keep that in mind. Um, and to pat ourselves on the back, while they had about, I think it was like 15 or 20% of the total cases being in the ED setting, we accounted for zero of the aspirations. They're almost always in the ICU. Um, they did find though that things that really did change the, um, the risk factors for aspiration were uh, ASA status. Uh, or if you're going for a bronchoscopy in these kids. So if you had an ASA of three or four, you were much, much, much more likely to have a complication, which makes sense. So what about studies that really just focus in on the ED population? Because all the studies I mentioned before largely are, uh, some of them are procedural sedations, yes, but not a lot of them have dedicated eMERGE sample sizes, which is what we really want to know, right? Like when we sedate someone, what, what are the risks for, for us? Because again, uh, a sedation for us is not a sedation in the OR. It's not a sedation for an endoscopy. We're not sticking tubes on people's throats. Um, so luckily we have a few studies that we can look at. First off is a Danish study that I'd like to just to mention to you guys done in the, the Netherlands, sorry, not Danish, uh, Dutch, um, where they looked at 1700 adults on, across multiple hospital centers uh, in the Netherlands, 19% uh, of which had fasted for less than three hours and that's both solids and liquids. Um, and they found absolutely zero cases of aspiration in their 1700 procedural sedation cases. And then again, very recently, another one, another, uh, another PEED study, they just like to study this stuff more often than adults do, which is fair. Uh, they had 6,000 uh, kiddos uh, undergone procedural sedation in the ED uh, and a, a very good chunk of them, 53%, did not meet any kind of fasting criteria, most of which didn't meet solid fasting criteria, which obviously has a longer fasting time as per guidelines. And once again, um, they had no aspirations regardless of fasting status. And interestingly, in this study, uh, this is the table from that one, um, if they looked at any adverse event at all um, throughout uh, the study, there is absolutely zero temporal relationship between how long you've been fasting and, an, a, a, and a risk for an adverse event. The line is just a solid, solid. Um, and finally, um, a good study that I, I, I'd like to, to point out to you, we'll just spend a lot, the last few minutes talking about this one by Bololio et al. in 2016, um, which is a meta-analysis systematic review uh, in the adult ED setting. It took 55 articles, which included a total of 9,600 sedations done in the ED, uh, and then kind of bro broke it down in terms of adverse events following sedation and used the random effects model to, to analyze it. Um, so essentially, like I said, adult patients, um, what they what, what I especially like about this study is that they they really only took studies after 2005. Again, trying to, to, to control for that, we've been getting better um, at sedating people over time. We use better medications, we use safer doses of medications, we have better monitoring like entitled CO2, et cetera. And so using more recent studies helps control for that, that variable. Um, they only use stuff that was relevant to us, moderate to deep sedation, and they looked at any medications that they were using in the ED. Um, here's a su summary table of all the different complication uh, that they that they had found. The one particularly of interest to us is the third column here, the aspiration column, uh, wherein 10 studies included uh, a case. Um, now that sounds like there might be a lot, but really um, I know it says 1.2 sedations per 1,000. That's just what the math works out to be. But of those 10 studies, they were all quoting the same one aspiration, which was in a 65-year-old lady that needed a hip reduction that they sedated with propofol and fentanyl. Uh, they couldn't get the hip back in place, so they waited a little bit. I think it was like 30 minutes. And then they sedated her again, and that's when she aspirated. Uh, that's the one case. Uh, over around 2,300 total sedations when you take those studies that included that one case. As you can see here, across the board, the, um, the risk of complications is 
almost universally quite, quite low. The highest being hypoxia, and I would take this number with a bit of a grain of salt because the, the authors here had a bit of a trouble um, in that many of the studies were heterogeneous in what they defined as hypoxia. Some was 94, some was 92, some was 90, et cetera, in terms of what hypoxia meant. So it's harder to, to, to get a good sense of what that variable really is. But even then, uh, the hypoxia level is still 40 in uh, 1,000 sedations, and much more common when we use propofol and midazolam. Um, other than agitation and or vomiting, which doesn't lead to more aspiration, um, really ketamine is, is has much less complication rates overall. We could go into detail about that, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so good things that I like about this study, A, is that it's one of the better population-based ED studies that from a meta-analysis point of view that we have, it's multiple database. They had two independent observers that were completely blind to each other that had really great inter-observer agreement. The studies that they chose themselves had very low bias. Um, but as with all of these, uh, like I said, the, the studies had high heterogeneity and making some multivariable analysis very difficult, if not impossible. These events, as, an, as, as I've hopefully shown you, have been very low incidence overall. So you need huge, huge, huge uh, denominators to get any kind of uh, risk determination accurately. Um, so it, it's hard, it's always, it's always important to take all the numbers that I've shown you today with a grain of salt for that reason. I, and again, since all these studies are observational, they have no controls and they're typically done with higher, um, high, highly trained academic setting um, sedation teams. Uh, the, the, the overall incidence rates are, are probably underreported. Um, and this study finally just doesn't, doesn't go into deep, deep detail in terms of what other risk factors that they had associated with all these things, again, due to heterogeneity. Um, just to, to start closing off here, this is, a, this is a lovely table from the Association of Anesthetists that uh, kind of um, have the same gripes as me in terms of what the fasting guidelines are and what they should be, um, which breaks it down more so in, in, in terms of what the patient's risk factors are for aspiration rather than just the objective amount of time that they haven't been eating for. And if you look from uh, left to right, if you look at if, if they have no risk factors and you have an urgent or emergent procedure, you don't delay based on fasting time. And even if, even if you didn't need to delay because it wasn't urgent, uh, it's really just two hours for anything solid, which isn't very long. And then as you go down moderate, uh, mild and moderate risk factors, the most important being throughout all these studies, again, ASA status, so comorbidities, um, whether or not you're doing a high risk procedure. So in adults, that's endoscopy, kids more bronchoscopy, endoscopy as well, um, and or comorbidities that specifically affect your gastric emptying time. So hiatal hernias, small bowel obstructions, if you have a significant intracranial injury, et cetera. Uh, obviously, if you're also very, very young, 12 months or less, which is puts you at higher risk for bus, basically anything. But again, if you look at the bottom of the table here, urgent or emergency procedures do not delay based on fasting time alone. Um, so I've been talking for a while now, but just to review, um, so hopefully I've been able to show today that multiple large scale retrospective studies so that there's overall very, very low risk of aspiration, especially in the ED setting. As time has gone on and I've looked more in terms of specifically what we do in the ED, our sedations are much safer from an aspiration point of view than things like an endoscopy or in the OR suite. Um, there really hasn't ever uh, or and may never be any clear data showing association between gas volume, pH, fasting time, and aspiration risk. All of this is, is largely theoretical based on a few animal studies. And really the risk factors that are important for, for complication rates, especially aspiration, are more so high comorbidity, predisposition to regurgitation, and those high risk procedures, which luckily we don't do much bronching or um, endoscopy in the ED. Uh, so things that I want you guys to take home with you is just think of those risk factors that we mentioned uh, and that can make uh, procedural sedation more complicated and never delay sedation based on fasting status alone. It's, we, we're very good at thinking about the risks of doing something, um, but we don't always think about the risks of not doing something, the risks of delaying uh, a much needed procedure. And with that, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Andre. Uh, great talk. Um, lots of lots of studies in there. Um, don't see anything in the chat. Uh, if anybody has any.